On today's episode, I'm going to give a critical and frank review of the Beatles film Let It Be. We're going to look at the highs, the lows, and everything in between here on Pop Goes the 60s. The film Let It Be was released on May 13, 1970, about a month after the breakup of the Beatles was publicly announced. So you can imagine the atmosphere uh, that this movie was released into. Uh, you know, fans were disappointed that the Beatles broke up, and reviewers gave mixed reviews of it. But really, I, I think the reviews were pretty accurate in saying that it was somewhat dismal. Beatle fans like myself, who came just after the Beatles broke up and started listening to their music, uh, probably didn't get a chance to see this movie. I never saw this movie until probably the 90s. And my copy of it is a bootleg because it was originally released in 1970, but it wasn't released to home theater uh, until 1981, which came out on VHS tape, Betamax, and Laserdisc. It probably has been seen shown on cable numerous times, but it never got a, the re-release that it deserved. It was supposed to come out in 2003 uh, as a companion piece to Let It Be Naked, and the Beatles went through this, the expense of doing all the audio commentary, the restoration, DVD extras, only to cancel the release. So I wanted to get this review in before it gets a proper re-release. Not sure when that'll be, but soon, we hope. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the film. So this film was directed by Michael Lindsay Hogg, and I just want to talk a little bit about him before I go into the review. Uh, Lindsay Hogg was hired by the Beatles to do several of their music videos. He had done some work for the Rolling Stones. He had done the Rolling Stones uh, Rock and Roll Circus in late 1968, and John Lennon was a part of that. There was probably some discussion about using Lindsay Hogg for the Let It Be project. Now originally, Let It Be was going to be a TV special anyway. It wasn't going to be a feature film. And I think because the Beatles owed another feature film, that that's why it became a, a, a feature film. And Lindsay Hogg really was a bit green. He wasn't a, a ringer to do a very high-end documentary. And the Beatles probably, the, the Beatles weren't used to being directed anyway. By this time, they were doing the directing. And Lindsay Hogg was probably uh, under strict directions from them on how this film was supposed to be, which by many accounts was to be a warts and all showing of the Beatles in the studio. And there was going to be some kind of uh, concert at the end. So that was how it was conceived initially. And this film is, I'm going to break this into really three separate sections. The first section of the film, the Beatles are in Twickingham Studios uh, rehearsing. Part two, the second part, is they are in the Apple Studios recording, and finally, uh, spoiler alert, I'm sure you all know this, they close the film on the rooftop of Apple, which uh, is, gives a pretty good close to this film. So I'm going to show you some clips from the film here, and I'm gonna, the, the copy that I have is actually a, a bootleg, like I mentioned, and that was transferred from the Laserdisc. And unfortunately, when they made the Laserdiscs and the tapes in 81, they used a real crappy source, so it's not a, a, a very clean copy, and they cropped it uh, for television, so I don't get the 4 by 3 aspect ratio, so that's, that's a problem. So going in, that's what I'm looking at, but I'm going to critique a little bit of Michael Lindsay Hogg's style of, of producing here. So the film opens up in a very dark uh, Twickenham studio where the gear gets set up and then Paul and Ringo are sitting at the piano, Paul's playing a little bit, and this is about as dismal of a place outside of hell that you could re film a movie. I mean, it is. it looks like everything the Beatles said it, it felt like, and that was cold and dark and dreary. And just by looking at the first opening uh, frames of this, you, I totally felt that. Now, as the Beatles get together and start playing, you're introduced to each one. Uh, you see their faces, they're starting to jam a little bit. And Yoko Ono is brought in right up at the front, so you know she's going to be a part of this movie. But one of the things that I really dislike about this film is the lighting is lousy. It's either lit too dark or it's just, just light is blasted on the Beatles. There's no key lighting. Uh, it's as if they didn't. Uh, 
They could have set the chairs up and said, okay guys, this is where you sit and lit properly, but they didn't really do that. Now, I understand I'm looking at a crappy copy and it is a little darker than it otherwise normally would be, but um, Lindsay Hogg's composition generally just isn't very good. Some of the shots would even have all four Beatles in them. Now this part of the film, uh, the audio that we hear is from the film reels, so it's not supposed to be studio quality, but unfortunately uh, the sound quality isn't very good. And when Lindsay Hogg zooms in on one or two of the Beatles to hear them talking, if they're off mic, you just don't hear the audio that well. Um, the other thing that I find problematic is, and this is I guess an editing issue, is that uh, some of the synchronization between the music and the, the speaking and the film isn't all synchronized properly. And it, I, could, I could tell pretty easily, um, and I, I think that's just amateurish to me. So after a few numbers, the Beatles start to get it together, and they, unfortunately there's a lot of numbers that they're doing that just don't sound very good. They're old standards or their, their own songs that are just not very well rehearsed. But they do start to get it together with songs like Two of Us and then I've Got a Feeling, and these are full band, uh, band rehearsals, which are pretty good. And then uh, we come to the part, the, probably the most famous scene in the film, where Paul and George are having a, a, like a, a kind of a terse disagreement here, like a very quiet argument. They're trying to kind of keep it on the down low. And one of the problems about this part is that the audio isn't very good again. Here we have a very, this is probably the best, one of the best scenes in the movie because we see the band actually working together. And it's probably a scene that would have played out in any album they recorded, but we don't get to hear it very well. And maybe when this gets restored, maybe they can do a little something with the audio so we can get a better listen to what's actually going on. So as the Beatles go through more songs like Across the Universe um, and One After 909, one thing we don't see is when George walked out, he left the band uh, at the studio one day and was gone for a couple days, he was dissatisfied, and there's really no mention of that in the film at all, which is somewhat of a shame, I think, because I think that's part of what this whole process of making this album was about. We just try, we just have less of those, nothing's gonna change my, just have one each time, two at the end. So they got George to come back under certain con conditions. George said, well, I don't want to have some concert, some, you know, some big concert. Um, and there were other conditions that he asked for that essentially was granted. Now at this point, they moved out of Twickenham Studios into a much more comfortable place at the Apple Basement Studios where they started to actually record. And from this part of the film, you went from this, this background of Twickenham Studios, which is very dark and black, cavernous, to the Apple Studios, which are, are like white walls and just feels cheerier the instant you start seeing this film. So during this period of the film, we see the Beatles working on more songs. Billy Preston is brought in at this point, and he's adding piano to the songs to fill out the arrangements a little bit more. And they go through For Your Blue and Dig It and uh, uh, a few other songs and then we come to a, basically what is the climax of the film where they decide to have a concert on the rooftop during a lunch session of the Apple building. So this for me is the best part of the film. So you have the Beatles really engaged, they're giving a concert, they're playing to the cameras. This was a last minute decision to do this concert up, up on the roof of the Apple building because they couldn't figure out where to hold, hold this concert and they did this, uh, people couldn't really see them very easily, they're in the very top of the building, and one of the best parts of this film, I think this is where Lindsay Hogg does a great job, is the multiple camera shots he has on the roof, plus all the people down below and the interviews he conducts of them and what they're listening to.
So the rooftop sequence is about 20 minutes of the film, and I think that's about half of what they actually shot up there. And f this was easily the best part of the film, the most fun, and probably gave audiences, uh, at least they ended on a high note. And because they sounded great, and some of the versions that were recorded on the roof are what came out on the album. My overall feeling on this film is that it just isn't up to Beatles standards. Beatle fans, I have to imagine, would have been disappointed by this because obviously all through their career, their standards were, standards were very high and I think fans had a right to expect that. And to see this film, especially a month after they announced a breakup, must have been a disappointment. I can see why reviews were mixed, which I think is putting it kindly. I mean, the review, I think the reviews could have been much worse. Uh, there's a couple things that I think that would have made this film better. And that is to interview the individual band members during the filming. I mean, that's one thing he didn't do. We know a lot of history about what went into making that film now. So we kind of put that on the film, but really the film as it stands on its own is, is, is not their best work. Now, the new film that's gonna come out by Peter Jackson, there's 55 hours to choose from. It'll be interesting to see what wound up on the cutting room floor. That, or what wasn't used. So one last note on Michael Lindsay Hogg. Now Hogg really never developed into any director of, of note. I mean, he, he stayed in television and didn't do feature films. So I'm wondering maybe this film, maybe he was a little bit green for this project and wasn't really the right guy. Uh, he certainly was a guy they could push around a bit because he didn't have a lot of experience. So that's my two cents on that. I think what we're going to find out as time goes on in some of these other books and these writers like Mark Lewis and talk about this time frame, we're going to find out more about what actually went on during this period and why certain decisions were made. Well, that's all for today's video. Thanks for watching. Make sure to check back here. I'll have more Beatle videos and other 60s bands featured here on Pop Goes the 60s. Mm -hmm.